Hi and welcome to this analysis of the August 2015 strategic case study um, for the Glory Soccer Club case. Now let me give you a brief introduction to myself just so you know who I am and um, what I'm going to do for you over these, uh, these series of videos. So my name is Nick Best and I'm Managing Director here at Astranti Financial Training and I've got nine years of case study experience. I was the official SEMA learning system author for the previous case study, that was the old T4 case study before the syllabus changed last year, and worked closely with the examiner there. I have spent, I suppose, the last, last nine years of my life focusing on case study exams, written mocks, I've reviewed hundreds of mocks that we've uh, worked on here at Astranti um, over all the different case studies that there have been. I've marked thousands of script. I've delivered hundreds of course days. I've worked one-to-one -one with many individuals, particularly focusing on what it takes to help people to pass the exam. And what I really want to do is bring all of that knowledge and experience of what it takes to pass case study exams and particularly focus that on this new strategic case study. We've had two sittings so far and I want to sort of bring out some key points as we go through this um, series of cases. I have tutored um, the old T4 case study at BPP and CAT Plan and First Intuition and Read Business Score before um, setting up a Astranti. So uh, look, I've, I've seen all the different ways of teaching case studies and I really want to bring that knowledge to bear to share with you in this video series everything that I can in terms of analysing this um, Glory Soccer Club case and to really guide you as to what you need to pick up from it into um, to for the really the key points, the key points related to the industry, the key things that I think are going to come up in the exam. So that's really where I want to take you over this series. So let me go through in a little bit more detail then what this series will be. This is video one in the series, and but throughout the series um, of it'll be about eight and nine, vi nine, nine videos. Hard to know exactly until I've exactly gone through and um, and done them all. But I start off on the first few videos by really going through the case section by section by section and normally it'd be two or three pages at a time really bringing out the E3 part of the syllabus thinking very much about the various different business models we'll do a Pestel analysis and a SWOT analysis and a five forces analysis and the other key models from that we'll also go through and I'll think about what I think are the key hints at exam issues as we go through so I'll be raising those as we're proceeding through the case. Um, what you should be doing is you should be taking those hints and tips and then using those to guide where you're focusing your study and um, the types of issues that could come up in your exam so you're ready for those. Okay. What I'm also going to do as I go through is just give you various different exam hints and tips. Uh, things that, but to be honest with you, the way I do this is, is just as something occurs to me, if as, as I'm going through and I think, oh, well, yeah, that would be a useful thing to share with people. I mean, I will cover all those hints and tips on my course video series for those people joining the course, or if you just buy those um, course videos individually. But I just throw a few of those in as we go through this, just as a, a kind of pointer, particularly as I think that those might relate to the exam itself. So we'll go through three, maybe four videos focusing on E3. Then we need to have an F3 focus, a focus on the financing and the funding of this business. In that video, we'll specifically have a look at the numbers. We'll do some um, analysis of those numbers in relation to this case study and really pull out what those key numbers are and really effectively what you need to use those numbers for. As and we'll go into the exam hints and tips now, as I'm sure you know, there are no extra calculations needed at the strategic case study level, but you can use the numbers and you should use the numbers. So how do you go about doing that and what are they in this case? That's what we'll be looking at there. Then P3, our big focus on P3 is going to be risk and risk management. That's a big part of the strategic case study exam. And so what we need to do is go through and look at what the key risks are, any other P3 elements, there might be elements of things like um, ethics or relation to auditing or relation to foreign exchange and so on. So we'll pick up on anything like that as well. But um, we've got our focus, big focus will be risks and risk management. Um, very important that and come up in a number of the variants of the case studies as we've seen them so far under the new SCS. 
Okay, then I'm going to be going through a strategic analysis, and that strategic analysis is going to go through each of the key models. I will create all of the models for you. I will go through all those business strategy models, Pestal and SWOT and Ansoft's matrix, generic strategies, um, product lifecycle, and so on and so on. I will work those through with you and guide you in the direction of how you can use those in the exam. I will then cover my top 10 issues, the issues that I think are the most likely to come up given this exam. And actually, um, one thing that I've found, I've been doing those now, although I've been teaching this for um, nine years, as a, a case studies for nine years, I have, I've only been doing that for around the last two. And it's remarkable how many hints there are in the pre-scene as to what's to come up in the exam. And normally, my top four or five issues are there in the exam. And normally, my sort of six, seven, eight, nine, or ten, probably about half of those are in um, the exam as well, in terms of one of the variants of the exam. OK, remember, you do get five different variants of the exam. And so um, your particular exam could be any one of those uh, five different variants. OK, so I'm going to go through section by section. I'm going to assume no prior knowledge of this case study. I'm going to be going through assuming you haven't read anything later on and assuming that we don't know anything else from later on. So that in a sense, this can also be your first run through the case as you're listening to me. But what I will do is I will sort of stop you. I'll ask you to read through a section, it'll be three or four pages, make your own notes, then come back and hear my view because I think that you are best with that combination of viewpoints. My view combined with your own ideas will combine together to get you some really good analysis of the case. Okay, so we'll go through section by section all the way through, then we'll cover F3, then we'll cover P3, we'll do the analysis, we'll do my top 10 issues. Okay. Now just a quick warning for you, another one of my little tips as we go through. The pre-scene that we've got, that we're going to go through, this is the context of the ground, it's of the exam, it's the background to the exam. It is what you must not do is pre-write and learn anything in relation to that pre-scene and go into the exam with that pre-learnt. What you must do is answer the question that comes up on the unseen on the day of the exam. But what's very, very important is you do use the pre-scene. The examiner, after the recent uh, March exam, when the examiner gave the post-exam guides, specifically focused on people not using the pre-scene. One of the comments was, you wouldn't have even known there was a pre-scene given some students' scripts. In fact, I think the basic feeling was was that it, it felt as if some people just didn't even know the pre-scene. They hadn't really gone through the pre-scene, they didn't use the information in the pre-scene, and they really want you to, the examiner team, they really want you to use that pre-scene. And really that's, again, the purpose of this video series, to really get you to grips with the pre-scene and use it as background to help you answer the questions that then come up in the exam on the day of the exam. In particular, my last point on there, any recommendations that you make, you should make them in the context of the pre-scene. So we will, for instance, do a SWOT analysis. Now, SWOT's very simple, but you should always ask yourself the question is, if you make a recommendation on the day of the exam, is it consistent with the strengths? Does it overcome weaknesses? Take the opportunities, deal with the threats. And so that's just a small example of how you can use the pre-scene information to come up with logical recommendations on exam day. So let's get on with the pre-scene itself then. So here we have it, Glory Soccer Club. And what I'm going to do on this first video is I'm going to go through the first few pages. And this is what I suggest you do, is that you print out a copy of the pre-scene yourself and you start working through doing your own analysis. I'm going to go through this um, first very short page here. Then we're going to look at uh, Carter Sanguera. And then we're going to go through and look at the Valdun Soccer League, which will take us down to, well, what page is this one here? This is page five. OK, so read that through. Do any analysis. Now, what I'm going to suggest that you do as you're doing your own analysis is that you, um, you think about the various different models, particularly the E3 models. OK, 
Okay, so be thinking about the strengths and weaknesses. Be thinking about um, pestel factors. Be thinking about Porter's five forces factors. So go through, think about those, think about what the key points are, think about any hints in terms of what's likely to come up in the exam, given the issues that are coming up. Do that, spend 10 minutes, come back to me, and I will then give you my analysis of these first few pages. Okay, so go and do that now. Right, okay, so welcome back. Hopefully you've gone through, done your own analysis. Let me give you my analysis of these first few pages then. So the first thing here is we are told our role. So our role is as a senior finance manager working for Glory Soccer Club, which is going to be known as Glory later uh, as we go through the case. Now, your role in this case is not to be ignored. And what some people are not aware of is the SEMA do provide you with a role guideline for the strategic case study. So let me just very, very quickly remind you of that guideline. OK, so there we have it then. This is the role that you are expected to take in the case study exam. So as the senior manager, you advise top level management as they formulate a strategy for the business. And notice, actually, when we get down to the bottom, it does specifically say you may have to influence your chief financial officer or financial director and the rest of the senior management team. And in actual fact, one of the key criteria in this exam is the people criteria. And under that heading, influence comes into it. So you are having to provide good, strong, sensible advice to take the business forward. And notice that as part of your role, we are told here that you must provide strategic options and make recommendations upon those options. OK, so you'll be expected to do analysis of the information that's in this pre-scene, then what's come on the unseen, analyse that and then make recommendations. And you can see here, actually, that part of your role is to analyse the options. What they mean by analysing options is, let's say you've got um, a scenario, maybe it's a football club and we're thinking about buying three players. We would have to analyse which of those players to buy. Now, you're unlikely to see that. Far more likely it would be some kind of buyout or some kind of issue, sort of staffing issue. But ideally, you will look at a number of options before finally making a clear recommendation. OK, these are the kind of possible courses of action that could be taken before finally making that recommendation. Notice you need to consider risks. That's the P3 side coming out here. And you also need to consider the sources of finance. That's the F3. So notice that we've got E3, F3 and P3 covered in your role. We've got to analyse issues and make recommendations where we can. Do where you can, given the nature of the requirement. If you can make a recommendation, do. If not, then just give us a simple conclusion. That's very good exam technique. OK, look, so that's the standard role SEMA give us. And we take this back to Glory Soccer Club and we can see that, yes, you are a senior finance manager. Notice it's a finance manager. So, of course, you're going to bring in your financial skills, your F3 skills. And actually, to be honest with you, all of your skills from all your studies. One key... Um, tip for you just something to bring out here is that in particular from previous studies um, e2 is the most important of all the topics the reason is is under the people skills criteria the e2 stuff on leadership um, actually the leadership criteria as well but leadership and people skills things like motivation strategies teamwork tuckman um, Hertzberg and Maslow's motivation, the leadership and management, those do seem to be coming up a lot in the first. Well, we've seen 10 variants of the exam so far. This does seem to be a big trend. So look out and revise your E2 leadership and motivation and management uh, material. OK, that's coming up a lot so far. Right. So look, we've got to get on with glory here. I'm talking generally about the exam, which I will do as we go through. But I really want to sort of get down to analyse glory um, in a lot more detail here. So look, you know, we ha have got a football club here, okay, or a soccer club as they're called. 
Um, you know, I'm probably going to end up calling them football because I'm from the UK where we call it football. Of course, soccer is very American, but actually soccer is obviously the term that they use in Valdunian. OK, and it's the Valdunian Soccer League. So um, maybe I'll try and use soccer as as we go through. OK, so look, a soccer club, a football club. OK, now, next thing we need to ask ourselves are what are. And this is a model. So this is our E3 model. What are critical success factors as they relate to a soccer club? And let's just have a think about this then. Now, what this is going to mean is, is that as we are going through the case, we need to be looking at these things in particular in terms of how good they are, at them, how poor they are. OK, what we will also do is add to some of these critical success factors as we see new information in the case. So look, critical success factors. Let me go through what I think are some of the key ones. OK. Look, probably the most important thing here is excellent football players. And I'm going to link that into the recruitment of football players, therefore needs to be good. So we need to recruit good football players. Now, part of that is going to be funding. Football clubs tend to need significant amounts of funds to buy the best players. The more money you've got, the better players you can buy and the more successful you can be. Um, the best players are very expensive. OK, what we're going to have to do is have a look and see what the position of uh, glory is and this league and the level of player that they're going to be um, buying and therefore the amount of money that's available and things like that so um, but funding is going to be critical funding for buying the players but also paying salaries as well uh, Wayne Rooney earns something like £300,000 a week just as one example of a very good player and the kind of money that they are making so it's not just the salaries it's the the millions of pounds how much was it when um, Gareth Bell was um was sold to Real Madrid 80 85 million pounds we're talking huge amounts of money for the best players now unlikely that we're going to be in the same league for a um in, in this particular country but look funding is going to remain really critical okay absolutely vital I'm going to put down training, the training staff and the training ground and the training techniques and keeping the players fit. I'm going to put down the manager and the management generally. Uh, as you know, with football teams, a great manager dramatically changes the performance of the team. Uh, we think about, say, someone like Manchester United, who had Sir Alex Ferguson, and he'd been amazingly successful over a 20-year career. Immediately a new manager comes in when David Moyes takes over and they have their worst season in, I forget how many years, 15, 20 years. Um, the change in manager changed everything in relation to that club. So the manager, absolutely crucial, vital that we've got someone that's skilled, knowledgeable, that can do the business for the team. OK, there's... Match day operations is going to be critical to this business as well. Uh, on a match day, bringing in all the fans, operating all the food stores. I'm going to put down here fan safety is going to be very, very important um, too in terms of, do you, think, do you think I can spell safety? There we go. OK, so fan safety is going to be critical. Uh, football can be... Yeah, certain countries, certainly here in the UK, if we're going back 20, 30 years, a lot of hooliganism that's still very prevalent in some countries today. And so actually keeping the fans in a safe environment um, where there are no problems with violence and things like that is going to be really, really crucial. OK, emotions do get very strong during football games. And so therefore, fan safety is going to be a key element. And my final one for the moment is merchandising and sponsorship. So huge amounts of money coming in through sponsorship and merchandising. That's kind of linking back to the funding, actually. But also it's a, a sales 
case of selling to the merchandiser, so selling the merchandising, selling the sponsorship, um, bringing that money in from those other sources. So doing that, doing that well, building the brand is also going to be critical. So look, we've created those critical success factors and now is a great time to do that because now what we can do is as we go through the case, we can start looking at how good glory are at these key elements. Where are their strengths? Where are their weaknesses? What do they need to improve upon? Good. So we're a soccer club then. Now, next thing to notice before we um, before we move on is that we are in a large and prosperous country, uh, Veldoon. OK, now immediately I think, right, let's try and link this through to um, any particular models. And for me, this is where the pastel comes in. And I'm particularly thinking economic side of pastel because we're in a prosperous country. That means that potentially um, the football club could have relatively wealthy fans coming in here. Also things like merchandising, sponsorship. There could be wealthy companies that will want to sponsor the football club. And so prosperous then means plenty of money to help to generate the money from those various different sources. So you know, economically strong. That's a very good position for the, the, the soccer club to be in. Good. Let's move on to the next section. So in this next section, then we start to learn about Carter Sanguera. Now, Carter is the founder of the football club. And he's got a, a background as a very successful businessman. He was the founder of an energy group, a quoted conglomerate um, and one of the country's largest companies. He is extremely rich, one of the 500 wealthiest individuals in the world. Now, of course, this is going to be very useful to a football club to have a very rich benefactor. Now, what we're going to have to look for as we go through the case is the extent to which Carter is willing to fund the business. Um, I'm sure that many of you know people like his various different wealthy be benefactors but Roman Abramovich is one. Roman Abramovich of course is the benefactor for Chelsea and is reported to have put two billion pounds into Chelsea Football Club. You know quite a staggering amount of money and to be fair he's had great success they've won the champions league actually just this year just uh, gone they just won the premier league again number of times that they've won the premier league since abramovich has been in um probably without his funds there would have been very little or minor success actually before he came chelsea was a kind of run of the mill um premier league club he came in put the money in and you know look at them now as one of the the world's major football um, teams okay extremely successful because of course that money brings in the best players the best players play the best football they also got the best managers potentially as well possibly the best manager that Chelsea have got um, possibly the best manager in the world in Jose Mourinho and so look having a benefactor is is useful now what we're going to need to look for then as we go through the case study is the extent to which he's going to put his money in and support the club and how does that compare with other clubs in that particular um in this league the Valdun soccer league so we'll look through that as we go through okay but he is an experienced business person um now just because you run a good energy business doesn't necessarily mean that you're a great um, leader of a football club but certainly having the funding and the finance is a great help. Um, I think that we now need to think about where he is in Mendelo's matrix, the stakeholder mapping matrix. Now we know the stakeholder mapping matrix is an important model in this exam. It was very useful if we go back to the pilot paper back on the sort of pilot paper stage of the strategic case study where uh, stakeholders were important. We also know that the people requirement is big on stakeholders as well. So he would be a key player in the business with very high power and very high interest. Um, probably the most powerful person in the club. But we'll have to see as we go through. Okay. So he decided to set up this football club. He thought it would be an interesting challenge. And he also thought it could be commercially sound, although actually there's always a big question mark over football clubs. You take someone like Chelsea 
and you know the money has come from Roman Abramovich, not that it's come from uh, being a profitable club. There's very few big clubs that are commercially sound. Some are, but the, you're not talking about very many that are generating significant funds without the, you know, and being really successful without money coming in from uh, from elsewhere. Okay, so let's pick up on some other points here. Now we are told about another stakeholder here. Durup Gelot, who is the founder of the Valdun Soccer League. Now we're going to need to um, look at the power here of this individual Durup. My guess is that he may well be a key player. We do see a bit more on him just over the page. I'll put a little question mark next to him for the moment. The reason is, is that as the founder of the Soccer League, um, a powerful player, likely to have power, power over the clubs. I'm thinking a little bit like Bernie Eccleston, who uh, manages Formula One, hugely powerful over both the, the teams in Formula One and the way the whole thing is uh, run. He could be a little bit like that, interested in each of the clubs as well, likely to be a key player, um, even for the specific league, even though, as we find out shortly, that each of the clubs is independent of him, he's still a very powerful individual with a key interest in each of those different areas. Someone we definitely have to listen to and be very careful of um, those views. Okay, let's go back to um, Carter then. And it says here that he wanted to set up the football club to enable him to use some of his wealth to serve the community as well as the fact that he loved football as well so it's worth us bearing that in mind and the reason is is that in the exam we virtually always have big corporate social responsibility issues because it's just a big topic that comes throughout the whole of SEMA and it's been uh, case study after case study after case study going back over the nine years that I've been teaching it we see ethics and we see CSR coming up again and again. We can probably bet that of the five variants there'll be of this exam, two, maybe three of them will have a CSR type question. It's very, very important at this level. And so why is this important then? Okay, is that let's say that there is some issue that's going to be either kind of poor ethics or it's going to be wrong for the community, we can come back to this statement here in the pre-scene. Do you remember I started off saying it's about using the pre-scene? We can come back to this statement in the pre-scene and we can say, and of course this is one of Carter's key focal points for starting the business in the first place and therefore we should do what's right for the community as opposed to whatever the issue is the other way around. So you can use this to justify some decisions okay now look while we're talking ethics and CSR then a little bit lower down here we've definitely got some uh, potential ethical issues and I'm thinking down here about you know he has um, his business contacts around and uh, he sort of lets them have seats in the best places in the ground um, for favors and to me that word favors is just the examiner hinting at this being an issue is that he's having people around he's doing them favors is there something like bribery going involved here or you know you I do this for you you do that for me and potentially it could end up being that there's some kind of unethical favor it's just the use of that kind of language as you look through the pre-scene um, often it hints at issues like that so I can almost bank on that being an issue somewhere in one of the five variants is something to do with those favors and the rights and wrongs ethically of the kind of favor that Carter has done okay my next point I want to pick up on is that in Valdun the national sport is cricket not soccer not football now cricket therefore if we think about Porter's five forces cricket would be a substitute in Porter's Five Forces model. Now remember, a substitute is a different product that fulfills the same need. And therefore, it's going to be tough to change a national culture. 
it is the way it is. People are going to carry on spending their money, going to cricket matches, and the television companies are most likely to want to support uh, cricket. And that's going to be the main thing that's watching. And what immediately comes to mind is something like the IPL, the Indian Premier League. In fact, you do wonder if this is based on India. India have recently set up um, the Hero I League about two, three years ago now, which is a soccer league. And of course, with the you know, the IPL, the Cricket League, being set up prior to that huge, huge um, uh, business in the IPL. It could be this is based on Australia. Back in 2005, the A-League was set up, which is um, a set of football clubs in Australia. And, of course, cricket is also huge in Australia as well as one of the uh, one of the national sports down there, along with Aussie rules football and rugby and so on. So uh, could easily be based on that. Now, look, why is this important? Um, well, one thing is it's quite useful to have examples. Um, it's worth our while just uh, mentioning down here. OK, one of my kind of business tips. Examples are key. They are very, very important. Real life examples. The examiner in the March uh, 2015 um, post exam guide said okay, it was a big surprise to us when the examiners turned around and said people weren't using industry examples and they weren't applying to the industry effectively. And all of us tutors were thinking, well, that's because you told us that it wasn't important. Um, which, of course, is what they'd said prior to the exam, but actually they turned around, changed their mind effectively. And so we now know that knowing the industry, using industry examples are key. So if you know something about the A-League or the Hero League in India, and you can use that as an example to bring out, or even the Premier League, it could be, for instance, okay, the UK Premier League, Okay, or any other football league, MLS or something like that, which is another one. That's uh, the, the US one. But using those and understanding the industry is very important. Okay, and using that knowledge in the exam, the examiners are now saying, look, you must use that knowledge because they're critical. They were critical of people for not using it. Okay. So as we look over the page, then we do find out a little bit more about the uh, country and sport. You know, it's a good thing then that sport is a popular leisure activity, although with cricket being this um, a very established sport, it's going to be hard to get people to switch over from cricket to that. It's probably likely always to be a minor sport. And again, we'll find out more about it as we go through the case study, but, you know, that's a, uh, a likely situation. We do find out a little bit more here about Daruk, who um, launched the uh, Soccer League. Now, he is a major media mogul who has got interests in Vardoon's media industry, particularly owning Orbit Communication, who are the um, largest satellite broadcasting network. And he set this up almost primarily with a view of it being material for broadcasting. That puts him in a very powerful position generally in terms of funding and financing, revenues from media are critical to the success of many businesses, many football clubs, because um, it's really a huge proportion of their income. So look, he really is a key player, therefore. And I think while we're talking about him, let's just go down a little bit, um, you know, where, where it's talking about television rights, which is one of the major sources of income for football clubs, of which um, Orbit Communications um, uh, although all broadcasters are free to bid, Orbit Communications are the uh, company who have always won those bids. OK, and therefore I've got a big question mark here about has that always been won ethically? We've seen lots of issues, haven't we, with um, FIFA just over the last few weeks and the potential ethics over the World Cup bids in Russia and in Qatar and so has there been bribery that's been going on that could be you know bribery could be a big issue um, given the current goings on in the in the world and FIFA so I could easily see that being in a variant but also the fact that we've got Daruk being a hugely powerful stakeholder could he be somehow influencing the process so certainly there is a question mark that's being arisen there 
Okay, let's go back up then. There's some just generic information here that you can just read through. That's not particularly important to the business. I think for us of key importance are the four main sources of revenue. We really need to think about those, okay? We've got the sales of tickets to spectators, obviously, with money coming in. We've got the fees for the, telev the televised rights, okay? That's gonna be very important. And it does tell us a little bit lower down here the way that those fees are given with 30% being split equally between the 10 clubs in the league and 70% being based on the number of matches televised that tends to mean the best clubs get the most televised matches and therefore they get the best money. That's very similar to the way that the Sky um, in the UK, the way that they um, manage the Premier League revenue. So basically you need to be a good club to get the most of the revenues. Okay. Because that will attract more people, that will also attract more um, uh, more fans, as well as therefore more of that 70% of the television rights too. Okay, so let's go back up. What are the other sources of income then? So we have got sponsorship, okay, such as having um, sponsor's name on the, the, the shirt. Uh, we've got um, sponsorship around the grounds and banners and things like that. And we've got the sale of merchandise. Um, uh, for which we are probably primarily looking at uh, sales of shirts. It tells us a little bit later on about the merchandising and uh, club shirts. Now, a couple of interesting thoughts for you. Here is Manchester United's list of sponsors. It's just come off the Manchester United website, which is what I've got on the screen at the moment. And what's amazing is just how many sponsors that they have of all different kinds. You've got your main sponsors like Aon and Nike and Chevrolet. Chevrolet is who they have on their uh, their shirt. But you've then got all these other ones like your official gaming sponsor. We've got the official beer, Shinga beer. We've got the official wine, Casillero del Diablo. Okay, actually one of my favourites, that particular that particular one. We've got Aeroflot being the official um, airline, official carrier, and then the official timekeeper, keeper, and so on and so on. And we just go through to all these official this and official that. We've even got an official paint, like an official Man United paint. Okay, um, and and we can go on through the various different sponsors, official tyres, motorcycle partners, gaming on um, gaming partners televisions i mean just remarkable the sponsorship opportunities um, for big football clubs are amazing of course these sponsors what they want is they want to associate themselves with the brand and that association gets them a uh, credos you know i just for example take someone like aeroflot a russian airline if we go back 20 30 years they were very well renowned for being a very poor airline with a very bad safety record and what they're trying to do is they're trying to um to to say well, look we have changed we are now different and we are sponsoring manchester united and this shows just shows you how um relevant we are and uh, we're linking our brand with their brand and so this is what's very very beneficial then to all these sponsors okay interesting to see the types of sponsorship they have though one other thing from the Manchester United um, website here as well is where does their income come from? And they're comparing here their 2008 revenue um, to the 2014 revenue. Just interesting to see how over those um, six years in what was supposedly in the UK a huge recessionary time as it was worldwide, um, just how big and how, how large an increase in that revenue has been but also there's the split between the different uh, types of revenue which actually links closely back to um, glory and um, we can see here that uh, we've really roughly got an equal split um, commercial being the biggest commercial is sponsorship and uh, merchandising and so on so you can see just how big sponsorship is and merchandising is that it plays such a huge role in the revenue it's absolutely massive OK, broadcasting is huge and then match day revenues um, huge as well. OK, and so, you know, we've got three very big sources of uh, finance. But interesting to see that, you know, approximately equal split. I know that, that commercial is easily bigger than match day, but 
Um, uh, it be worth our while as we look through the case, looking and seeing how that compares to uh, to glory in order to um, you know, maybe look for opportunities. Obviously, a club like Man United is extremely different from um, a club like glory, but it does show you the potential opportunities in the future. Good. So those are all the key points then that I wanted to raise in this particular um, section then. And in the next video, we'll go on and start to take a look through the, uh, the next few pages. Where we start to learn about the soccer club itself and the league itself. And we really start to delve down into the detail, the real detail that you need to know about the club to be able to apply it to the exam. OK, so I'll see you in video two. Okay, and if you're watching the free sample video that is on YouTube, then um, uh, this is where I've, I've sort of come to say goodbye to you in a sense. I hope you found this video really useful. And what you can do now is, well, I tell you what I hope you'll do is you'll go on and buy the rest of the series. The rest of the series will include me going through the remainder of the sections of the case, just like I've done with these first sections. And I'll go through giving you my views and my hints and tips and types of issues I think have come up in the exam. Then I'll do a financial analysis. I'll do a P3 analysis. I'll do all my, my full strategic analysis. So you really get to clips with the strategy i'll also do my top 10 issues and break those down for you this is to tell you what i think is most likely to come up and how to prepare for those so hopefully you'll think that's useful having seen this um this first um, video but of course you don't need to do that what you can also do is you can work this through if, of your own now if i was working this through by myself now what i'd do is go through very much in the way that i've been showing you how to do this in these, this, um, this video series uh, so far. Look for each of the key models. When you get to the end um, of working through the case and doing analysis and looking for all the use of models, then do a full strategic analysis using all your E3 models to really get to grips with that. Also then come up with your own top issues that you think are being hinted at most. So you can do it yourself, but I hope that you'll uh, visit um, strategy.com and, uh, and uh, use the video series there. And we've also got an industry analysis where we examine the industry in full. So you can purchase that separately. You can purchase the strategic analysis separately or all the video series um, as well. So you can buy all those different things. Or of course, you could just join us on the course when you get all that, plus the mock exams. Really critical to passing this is actually getting feedback on your mock exams. I Certainly, I see more than anything else, the thing that makes the biggest difference to students at this level is the feedback on the mock. Not just doing a mock, but getting the feedback on that. And of course, on the course, we give you feedback on um, four mock exams, and then you can attend my master classes that I do, and um, we've got full pass guarantee. So if you do the whole course and you fail, then you don't pay anymore. So please do um, think about joining the course where you'll get the whole series of all of our material um, in there as well. Good. I hope you found this uh, a useful video and um, hopefully I'll see you in uh, in the next video or uh, in uh, in some other element of your studies. And uh, if I'm not going to see you again, then just good luck in the exam.